From Micro TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 232, recorded on March 22nd, 2024. everyone. I'm Daniel Griffin. Uh, Vincent is out for the next few episodes, so we are going to try to do this without him. So wish us luck. Uh, Before I bring on our guests, um, remember to check out Mark Martin's new podcast, Matters Microbial at microbe.tv forward slash mm. And consider supporting the science shows of Microbe TV at microbe.tv forward slash contribute. Um, and uh, joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, we have huh. Dixon de Pommier. Hello there, everybody, as you would say. Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> looking out the window, it's a little gray. It's a little um, colder than it was last few days. Uh, all the trees are busy slurping back up their maple syrup to make sure that they don't waste it, um, hopefully, because uh, if they don't, they're going to be in trouble. And uh, tomorrow, uh, apparently, we're getting a deluge. So if you've got your yacht handy, um, Daniel, I think uh, maybe we could uh, use a lift. <laughs> All right. Maybe we want to cover it or something or keep it in very dry no, dock. No, 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 no. <laughs> Tell us where you are so that we can get on Oh, there. so when so, the waters rise. Yeah, okay. Exactly, exactly. I exactly. see it. And from Glasgow, Scotland, Christina Nala. Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. I was in the deluge earlier, probably about two hours ago, I looked like a drowned rat, but I'm glad to have dried up since, so. All right. Well, we have a little bit of a time thing, right? So we're on daylight savings time here in America, but you're just, do you guys do that over there in Scotland? Yeah, we're going to go on daylight saving, I think this coming weekend. So we're always a week behind. Okay. <laughs> so we'll have to keep track of that because in two weeks when we record the next time, I'm going to be right over there in Denmark. So, Ah, oh, gosh, it'll be even Ooh, later for to... you. It'll be 11 p.m. for you, 10 okay. p.m. for me, 5 right, p.m. So for I'll the rest. I have to keep track of that. That's mm. actually good for me because I'm going to try to get a little sailing in over there. So, uh, oh, that's nice. brilliant. You know, the later, I'll... the better. The later, yeah. the better. It means more sailing. I love right. Denmark. You'll like it. All right. Well, today we have a paper. Yes. Um, a, a great paper. It is The Cellular Lives of Wolbachia that was published in Nature Reviews Microbiology. Uh, the or- authors are Jillian Porter and William Sullivan, both at UC Santa Cruz, California, USA. Uh, I do apologize as this paper is behind a gosh darn paywall. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunate, as they really did a great job here, um, as you will see. Uh, but dare I suggest emailing William Sullivan and requesting he send you a copy if that paywall is standing in the way? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's get right into it. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start off with an executive summary, and then we're gonna go through the paper together. So for an executive summary, I'm gonna sort of walk our walk ourselves through the abstract. So let us start with what are Wolbachia? So as the authors tell us here, um, you know, and it's not an easy question to answer. What is Wolbachia? So Wolbachia, as the authors tell us, are successful gram-negative bacterial endosymbionts. Um, And as we're going to learn, they globally infect a large fraction of arthropod species, about half, and uh, filarial nematodes. Um, They go on to, and and we'll uh, deep dive into this, Um, they have the ability for efficient vertical transmission. They also have the capacity for horizontal transmission. Uh, They have the ability to manipulate host reproduction. And uh, sort of exciting, maybe reminiscent of our ant paper, they have the ability to enhance host fitness. Um, Now, Wolbachia are abundant. Um, They occupy a tremendous number of of diverse and evolutionary distinct um, niches. These niches are often within host species. 
Um, and in this paper, we're gonna we're gonna go through. Um, it's really it's a review. Why are we doing a review? Because I think we're gonna be talking quite a bit about Wolbachia in the uh, future episodes. So I, I want everyone, um, all our listeners, to feel like they're up to speed. Um, and so we're going to go through uh, and explore a lot of the uh, Wolbachia interactions. Um, and we are going to get some insights into these Wolbachia host cellular interactions and discuss really a lot. I'm going to probably spend a lot of time, my physician bias, my clinician bias, on um, promising <laughs> applications in controlling insect borne and filarial nematode uh, diseases. That sounds like a great plan. Okay. It does, it so does. On to the article, shall we? Yep. Indeed. So Lead on our Virgil. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'm responsible for leading the discussion, but, uh, you know, everyone jump in whenever they want. Um, so, as I mentioned, right, Wolbachia are these gram-negative bacteria that infect more than half of all insect species. Yeah, that's mind blowing, isn't it? It's, it's, it's just mind boggling. Mind. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's also they're also going to um, infect filarial nematodes, um, and one of the distinctions here is actually um, over time a lot of these filarial nematodes actually require Wolbachia for survival. Indeed, kill the Wolbachia, you kill the nematode. Right. Um, they also infect crustaceans and arachnids. <laughs> So pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sort of broad distribution. Um, now, you know, Dixon and I were chatting about Wolbachia earlier today right. um, as I was driving about. Um, as is our want. <laughs> <laughs> we are nerds. <laughs> Dixon, it's good to hear from you. No question about it. No question Let's about it. chat about Wolbachia. Um, Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that, that Dixon actually brought up was uh, familiarity with one of the first people to um, – sort of stumble across Wolbachia? Is that is that the best way to describe it, Dixon? It is, actually. Uh, his name is Bill Kozak, and uh, he and I were good friends, actually, for a long time. We used to meet at the American Society for a Parasitologist meeting, and um, the ASP, as it were. And uh, one year, he shows up and he says, you'll never guess what I'm working on. I said, you're right, I won't. <laughs> he used to do some, some work on trichinella, so I knew him then. And he said, well, I'm working on some filarial worms right now. And I discovered the most amazing thing. He said, they're infected with bacteria. And he didn't have a clue as to what it meant, of course, because it was early days. And uh, after that, I didn't see him at all because he began to go to other meetings. So um, he, I think in his own right, he became quite famous because it was because of him. Uh, and you'll go on to explain that, I'm sure. Uh, its uh, usefulness in uh, treating an intractable disease, which still exists, unfortunately, in West Africa and some places throughout uh, Central and South America. And he was he was Anca Circa, right? River blindness. Yeah, that's right. Had... That's right. He began with Anca Circa, exactly. But he also worked on, I think, Brugia malaria as well. Okay. Uh, which actually is a perfect um, perfect thing. We will we'll circle right back to it momentarily. Um, so yeah. So one of our one of our discussions was you know you know has there been you know a bunch of study on Wolbachia in a certain you know sort of context. So just to give us the history, right? So go back about a hundred years, um, and uh, we actually have this discovery of. Uh, Something, uh, some rickettsia-like bacteria infecting the ooze sites of Culex pipiens, right? That's a right. mosquito. Right. <laughs> um, you know, and then time goes a little bit forward. Um, we learn a little bit more about it. Um, and then, you know, the, the comment was, and I, I, you know, I feel like I was quoting the paper when I responded to Dixon. You know, I said, you know, there was this early interest, but, you know, then Wolbachia research languished. It did. <laughs> it did. Um, and actually, if you do a PubMed search, as our authors tell us, and you look at publications from 1960 to 1989, right, 29 years. 18 different. 18, right? 18 publications. That's it. 18. In 30 years. Oh. 18. Keaton, so people, everyone's like, yeah, that's fine. We're not interested. Moving on. <laughs> um, right? That's so, And how many then, do we have now? Hundreds. Uh, well, my gosh. I have to take uh, my yeah. shoes off to count. Yeah. The, <laughs> so during the 1990s, 
you know, we, we start to see a little more interest, 133 in the 1990s. Um, and then it really, it really starts to uh, really pick up as we, uh, as we move into the, the, uh, the realization that this is actually something that might have a lot of uh, potential here. So, well, the, um, the other thing that I think that you should mention is that this was the era of uh, DNA sequencing. This is when it first started, of course, but it, it r rapidly grew. And as a result, they got not just the DNA of the uh, organism they were studying, but the DNAs of the organisms living inside the organisms that they were studying. So um, to have to sort all that out uh, required, um, um, I guess, the gene bank. And, and finally we- Yeah, yeah, it was really, um, yeah. I mean, the first the first time we had uh, fully sequenced Wolbachia genomes was, um, you know, in the, about 20 years ago. So a little bit right, right after 2000, right? So yep. sort of Gosh, following a little bit. after I did my PhD. <laughs> This was still there. You could have jumped in on this, Christina. I didn't. You could have jumped in on this. This could have been. Yeah, I was doing a lot of sequencing during my PhD. Oh wow, nice. Yeah, and I. You might. Yep. You might also want to mention how it got its name. Oh, should we? Should we mention that? Should we talk about Bert Wolbach? You bet. Sounds like a brewer, doesn't he? Yeah. So, Beer yeah, the, by the, Bert so this was Hertzig, right? So, um, yeah, so Hertig, yeah. Hertig actually, when he um, when he finds uh, you know Wolbachia pipians, he actually names this after his advisor S. Bert Wolbach. So right. that's where we get Wolbachia. Exactly. Uh, yeah, sort of exciting. And and where where does this where does the organism fit in, sort of into the tree of life? And so we'll talk about the phylogeny. Um, and you'll, you'll recognize some of these terms, and I think it also helps sort of give it context, right? So phylum, proteobacteria, class, alpha, proteobacteria, order, rickettsiales. Right? Uh, so we sort of see that sort of connection there. Family, anaplasma, plasmata CA. Am I pronouncing that right? Maybe. Um, and then genus Wolbachia, right? So we could see yeah. a lot of similarities. Um, and then, as we mentioned, host insects, arachnids, crustaceans, filarial nematodes. Um, and then, you know, how how big? And this is sort of interesting because they're really it sort of breaks down the genomics into I'm going to say sort of two really different types of Wolbachia strains, right? So um, we've got our, our classic facultative um, Wolbachia strain, um, but there's actually an associated filarial nematode strain, the Brugia malayae um, associated. So, and you're actually going to see about a 20% about a difference in the size um, of the genome. Um, you're actually going to see more protein coding genes um, and so a little bit of variation here. So sort of interesting as we've got all our genomic stuff helping us learn. How many species of Wolbachia might there be? That's a good one. Um, those are the big ones that I break down into. But how many, yeah, how many species, how many subspecies? I'm not sure right. I know. I mean, because, you know, uh, if you look at the ecology of this rather than the uh, microbiology, and look at what happens when a species becomes geographically isolated, for instance. Uh, it tends to develop into a new species. So you mentioned its host range, and that, that's where you will find Wolbachia-like organisms. But um, for all of those hosts, um, which species infect which hosts? Basically, that's basically what I'm asking. Is that yeah. known yet? I'm taking a quick look here and see if I can actually find out, you know, how many different um, species. I can see how this gets into a spider. <laughs> <laughs> I've, just, I've just googled that as well. I haven't come with a with a number yet. So yeah. All right. At the, at the time of this writing, which was, let me see, when that paper was written. Do, do, do. Oh, I can't see the. I can't see. I can't see. It was after 2000. That's for sure. Okay. Really? When the references are in, um, I can't see the publication date, but at the type of time of writing this article here, more than 450 different Wolbachia strains with unique gene sequences, phenotypes, and infecting different hosts have been deposited in GenBank and the Wolbachia 
host database. Yeah. So How about that? And I would um, expect there to be an incredible number just when you figure all the different hosts, right? That it's got to, you exactly. know, all the different arachnids. And as the article points out, the uh, requirements in each host is unique. So the organisms have to take advantage of, um, well, you'll get to it. I don't want to spoil it uh, uh, because it's a, it's a great story. Actually, it's a great story as to how this integrates into the cellular mechanism of the host cell. And so where does it go? Back in, sorry. <laughs> Um, are you going to jump in there, Christina? Yeah, I was just going to say that was in 2006 that that paper on the genus of Wolbachia was published where they described more than 450. So I'm sure there'll be more now. Wow. So I, I love one of the sections, they call it Wolbachia lifestyle inside the cell, right? So it's a yeah. visual <laughs> on that. Uh, where's exactly. Wolbachia lounging about? Right. Um, and so remember, this is an intracellular organism. So it's going to associate with several cellular structures. It's going to associate and move around um, using the microtubules. Um, right. You know, and not only can it be intracellular in all the um, somatic cells, but it actually can actually get into the the, the germline cells, right? So, um, kind of important for some of the transmission that uh, we're going to be talking about. Indeed, I should also mention microtubules, right? The, I mean, uh, the Golgi, rather. I'm sorry. Yep, the yep. Golgi. The Golgi. Um, so it's like it looks like it's associated with membrane-like structures within the cytoskeletal mm -hmm. uh, portion of the host cell. Yep. Which, which, by the way, uh, when we get to uh, the end of our discussion, uh, we have a, a wonderful speculation to offer in terms of uh, a chemotherapeutic approach using a um, antihelmetic, which interferes with microtubule formation in nematodes, and it also happens to well. Well, stay no, tuned, I think, listeners. I think stay you, tuned. No, no, no. We can bring it up, and well, you know, we can sort of talk about this point. Not only are they associated with the microtubules, but they seem to be dependent. They require. So when you disrupt the microtubules, right. you're that's going right. to right. uh, you're right. going to decrease the number of Wolbachia that we exactly. see. Exactly. Um, which might be good, might be bad. We're going to have to talk about that. <laughs> So, um, so if you're a spider or a fly, <laughs> <laughs> or a worm, or worm. That's right. That's right. Um, so the, the first thing I want to go, and I do, you know, I, I encourage everyone, if you can get to this through your paywall or you can get through it through uh, shooting an email to William Sullivan, it's actually a nice link um, right when you're having trouble getting through the paywall and you can just email him and say, gosh, I heard your paper's <clears throat> fantastic from the crew at This Week in Parasitism and I'd love to read it. Um, and I spent a time, a bit of time going through um, this first biomedical application that is in box one. Um, of the article. And these are, they, they're going to go through some of the biomedical applications of Wolbachia, which is a nice way of actually kind of understanding what might be going on here. Um, and so here's this whole concept of Wolbachia mediated cytoplasmic incompatibility. Mm -hmm. And so, so what is that? And I think to understand that, we're going to have to understand a little bit about the sex life of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm sure, that's a uh, proper material for. I was. Our young I listeners. was. This is, what are we supposed to? If this is a triggering event for the children, you know, those under eighteen, you don't want your children to be hearing about mosquito sex life. Uh, that's right. <laughs> we'll, this, re this recording is labeled M. <laughs> we'll put something. You know, there is uh, sensitive material on the horizon here. That's um, right. But uh, yeah, so so one of the ways that we have tried to combat infectious disease is to uh, try to target um, insect populations, so mosquitoes, for instance. Right. And uh, what what was the big thing? We used to have these trucks driving through the streets and the kids playing and the stuff that was blowing oh. out of it. What what was that stuff? It's called DDT, <laughs> as it's <we> called. <laughs> Not such good stuff, right? <laughs> Not such good stuff. <laughs> yeah. So so you know one of one of the ways, and I think Rachel Carson sort of pointed out some of the the worries with approaching the world this way, with uh, filling it with toxic chemicals and hoping that the only um, uh, unfortunate consequence would be uh, destroying mosquitoes. We, we saw that there was a bit of an issue. So there became a lot of, I'll say, 
more sophisticated attempts to achieve mosquito population suppression. Um, and, and one of the strategies that was actually introduced in the 1960s um, was this um, irradiation of, um, of really of the males. <clears throat> so what you're going to do is you're going to radiate the males and you're going to release them out there so they're sterile males. And how does that help? And so I let everyone think for a moment. And here's one of these peculiar things about female mosquitoes. When a female mosquito has um, sexual relations, dare I say, with a male mosquito, um, the female mosquito is basically done for that mating cycle. They actually end That's up true. with a plug. So if that male was sterile, that female is now done. That female is not going to produce mm -hmm. eggs. There'll be no reproduction. Right. So that's, that's one approach, right? Um, now, here's an interesting approach when it comes to Wolbachia. What they do, they actually um, infect the eggs of the males that we end up with males that are Wolbachia infected. Now, the male goes ahead and has sexual relations with a female. Um, I'm going to talk about that female can be either Wolbachia infected or not. If the female mosquito is not Wolbachia infected and that male has sexual relations, um, that female will not be able to produce eggs because of this concept of cytoplasmic incompatibility. So that Wolbachia is actually going to prevent condensation of the chromosomes and it's going to prevent that egg production. But if the female is infected with Wolbachia, she's going to be able to go on and have those 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 eggs and go ahead and have offspring. So you can sort of see where this leads over generations. You're going to ultimately be selecting for females and males that are going to be Wolbachia infected because there's going to be a vertical transmission of the Wolbachia. So, so initially, only the Wolbachia infected females are going to be able to produce offspring. All the offspring are going to be Wolbachia infected. Right. And Pretty soon, the entire population is Wolbachia infected. But Dr. Griffin, who cares? There's still maybe just as many mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things we're going to learn about is that the Wolbachia infected females um, are actually less likely to transmit um, certain pathogens such as um, malaria. Right. And the males, of course, don't bite. So therefore, they are not... Um, a player in the transmission of diseases. Yep. So our ultimate goal so here it's is called, to get... Wouldn't you call yeah. that a bit of a meiotic drive uh, mechanism, even though it's not um, internally uh, genetically manipulated by the mosquito? It's uh, generated by being infected with Wolbachia, but it still drives the meiosis towards maleness. Uh, I, I actually worked in a lab uh, during my PhD next to the, where that was discovered because they worked with Aedes aegypti, uh, and uh, they discovered a gene that they could um, select for, which would do the same thing that Wolbachia does now. It produces mostly males as a result of the mating. Uh, and the, um, the end of the female, which receives the semen from the male, actually, you know, like you said, this plug gen is generated. And uh, I had I actually... Uh, <laughs> I don't brag much about this because I don't do work anything and I'm retired. But <laughs> when I did work, I did not work on mosquitoes. I worked on a, a trichinella. But I actually have my name on a paper that says that the substance from the male that's transferred to the female that induces the plug is a 300,000 kilodalton protein, which at least on a Cephros column, that's where the uh, material came out. Hmm. And um, it's a protein. And uh, it prevents the females from uh, receiving sperm from future matings. But she still has sex. That's the thing. She still has sex. So the, the sexual relationship is more or less like um, taking a birth control pill. I'm thinking, like sex... a, I'm thinking like a diaphragm, right? Because it's like a barrier, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. Exactly right. And uh, exactly yeah. right. And And you can actually... Find out which male succeeded. If you've got an entire insectary filled with males and one female, you know which one will give birth to the, uh, which will pass on his genes. The same was not true 
for Drosophila. They tried the same experiments in Drosophila because there was a Drosophila lab down the hall from where I worked also. And Drosophila uh, <laughs> has no plug and they can mate continuously and accept sperm from various males. So there's a competition among the male Drosophilas for the female, but it doesn't matter because everybody wins, basically. <laughs> Whereas in mosquitoes, only one succeeds. <laughs> yeah, it's really, I mean, a lot of the focus, right, as we're saying here, is really on getting this into the females. And I mentioned right. the the impact on, on different plasmodium, different malarias. Um, so certainly avian malarias. We also see this, um, you know, the Wolbachia infection in the Anopheles, uh, reducing the plasmodium uh, sporozoite populations, right? So helping mm -hmm. us. Um, so really kind of a win-win a for us. And, and, you know, and interesting enough, there actually is a, this is interesting, a fitness advantage, right? For the female right. mosquitoes. Female mosquitoes right. with Wolbachia, not only do they have a fitness advantage in the scenario we laid out, um, but there may actually be a fitness advantage over uninfected females for, for other reasons, other interactions with Wolbachia. Um, now, what about the other? So here we love Wolbachia. This is so great. Why would we want to kill Wolbachia? What situations would we want to kill it? And, and here we stay in the same box. We move down to the very bottom part. <laughs> now we have moved from the insects to the nematodes. And here, I think as we talked about early on, is that Wolbachia and the nematodes have actually developed a relationship where the nematodes require Wolbachia for survival. So actually, if we can kill the Wolbachia, we kill the nematode. Right. And other That's... than Loa Loa, right, which does not yeah. have Wolbachia, um, all our other filarial nematodes actually have this, uh, this relationship with Wolbachia. So we can kill Wolbachia with a six weeks course of doxycycline, and that will actually kill all the adult nematodes. You don't have any adult nematodes. No baby not nematodes. Babies. Yeah. No babies. Now, why don't the babies become infected? <laughs> with the uh, with the Wolbachia. Yeah, that's right. Because the female uh, Uncle Circa doesn't cause any illness. It's the larva that causes yeah, the illness. It's, it's the larva. So there is vertical transmission, right? But if you kill all the um, if you kill all the Wolbachia in the females and the adults, oh, yeah, of course, they're not going to produce any more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So pretty pretty amazing. Like so, the two sides of the coin with Wolbachia. Um, I'm going to move on a little. See what what else do we have in store in this article? Um, they, they talk a bit about um, you know the the vertical transmission as as we've discussed. Um, Interesting enough, and this this I thought sort of you know made me pause a moment. The reproductive uh, manipulation part. So Wolbachia actually have the ability to manipulate host reproduction. Okay, um, and one of these is this interesting um, male feminization. So they can actually turn. Are you ready for this? Wolbachia can turn genetic males into females. So that's why there's no young men working on Wolbachia, right? There's just this, this ungodly fear that females. this might happen to them. But they have a fitness <laughs> which goes way beyond. <laughs> they all get tenure. <laughs> I should mention, like Barnaby's biggest fear, spending too much time around his father, is um, is getting filarial disease and the impact filarial disease can have on a, on a male. So, uh, yeah, I shouldn't oh, have taken oh. him to see the... Uh, the, the photos. Um, but there's also parthenogenesis. So this is actually where you can have the development of a female gamete without fertilization. So really interesting. And we talked about that cytoplasmic um, incompatibility issue. So pretty, pretty amazing, you know, how much time and evolution has gone into these um, issues. And they were really nice, um, you know, again, referring back to the article, really nice box three where they go through... Um, all these different um, interactions. I think when you're associated with microtubules, then you have to look at what microtubules do. And they do everything, basically. They move intracellular particles around. They, uh, they're very important for the meiotic 
and mitotic uh, spindle. Uh, in, in addition to the centromeres, the, uh, the microtubules, uh, if you interfere with them, um, with a, a, a substance, uh, one of them is uh, colchicine, uh, which dis dis destroys the microtubules, the, <laughs> the cells don't divide any further. So this parasite, I don't, I'm not sure we'd call it a parasite, right? We're still calling it an endosymbiont. That's really interesting, right? Is it is it a parasite, what right? Is it? Yeah, what what <laughs> is a parasite, you know, on this week in parasitism? Because we're actually talking about how Wolbachia um, is critical for survival of the nematodes. It actually right. is helping the insects. It's not so great for the plasmodium, and I don't think we mentioned, but um, viruses. For instance, a Wolbachia infected right. insect is less likely to transmit dengue, less likely to transmit several viral diseases as well. And the plasmodium. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, hmm. Is it on our side or their side? <laughs> yeah. So we can talk well, about it, right? Yeah. Because we don't like those plasmodium and those worms, but is Wolbachia our friend or foe? Maybe our friend in many ways. It's basically made our worms very vulnerable, right? All we have to do is take it out, and that's the end of the worms. In our right. mosquitoes and, and um, other insects, we put it in, and we get certain advantages. Indeed. So I think um, one of the things I like, and we're going to spend maybe a little time just chatting, but I, you know, let the let the authors tell us what they, you know, came away from this investigation with. And uh, one of the things they say is, will Bakia serve as a case study for the unanticipated biomedical impact of curiosity-driven research? <laughs> I love it. That's that's a great phrase. Yeah, I, 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 I'm always a little bit, um, <laughs> I don't know, like Nels LD gets to end his shows with, stay curious. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> stay in Exactly right. You sure? we, we always get asked in science, like, oh, how is this going to help make the world a better place? What, what, are you, what disease are you going to cure? And I think as we're seeing here, you know, 100 years ago when someone was curious and stumbled across this, they didn't know what disease they were going to cure. And here is... Sure a hundred years of discoveries leading to the ability to save lives. Correct. Save so, lives um, from <clears throat> malaria, save lives from viral diseases, Correct. dengue, para all these other parasitic worms. Knowledge accumulates. And if you're careful about um, your reading, like I'm sure, Christina, you... Um, and and I, uh, Daniel's got a PhD also. So all three of us, if if you're going to research a problem, you've got to do the background research first. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, um, I went back further than that. By the way, <laughs> um, the, the the accumulation of knowledge allows you the privilege of not having to repeat all of that work. Uh, of course, some critical parts of it you might want to, to just to make sure that it's still true. But in the most um, in the most part, all of it is valid because it was reviewed by their peers, and so there. And then now you get to the point where you can begin where where everybody else left off, and take it to the next step. And uh, we have powerful tools nowadays for looking at all of this from a population standpoint or a pathological standpoint or a biochemical. I mean, wherever you'd like to go, you can go. And I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to have lived long enough to see that happen in my lifetime, where I was not, <laughs> I'm the oldest one here among you, <laughs> so I can use the uh, ancient sage approach to <laughs> the, the discussion by saying that uh, <clears throat> if I hadn't lived so long, I wouldn't know so much. And, uh, <laughs> it's true. The longer you live, if you're still curious, uh, you end up with a wealth of information, of, assuming you don't have Alzheimer's disease, of course, that you can then uh, apply to these uh, findings and speculations. Like I said, Bill Kozak had, he had no clue as to what he had stumbled. And you notice that soon after that, Everybody else said, oh, really? Uh, what is it? 
What does it look like? And, oh, it's a rickettsia-like organ. Rickettsia. Well, that's you know, that's interesting. And uh, will, will you, and th- that means you can't culture it apart from the host. Is that true? Well, so that's that's why genomics was so critical here, right? This is not not easy to culture, right? Um, intracellular, no. so you can't you can't just put it in some agar or anything and just expect it to grow. You can't just put it in a petri dish and you know add the right nutrients. Um, so that's a challenge. That's why it really is critical to have the 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 new tools that we now have to to do these Absolutely. investigations. Absolutely. And you know how far sequencing has come in just 20 years, because I, I don't know, when I did my PhD, I painstakingly sequenced a 2,000 <laughs> base pair <laughs> genes. It took me months. Right. And, now, right. and now you can literally sequence entire organisms in That's right. like a week or less. So it's That's astonishing, right. isn't it? Yes. Yes. It's now a tool rather than a... Yeah, yeah a way of accumulating knowledge for a PhD thesis. Uh, I knew Gerald Edelman and his group at Rockefeller while I was there as a postdoc, and and he became famous and won his Nobel Prize for sequencing the immunoglobulin G molecule. Uh, Today, that can be done, I don't know how fast, but pretty fast. You know, peptide uh, degradation and then uh, analysis for sequencing is a, it's a tool, basically, it's a tool. Uh, so these tools are are potent um, predictors of the future. That's what I was going to say. Yeah, um, no, it's just now, um, it's amazing how far it's come. Um, Vincent and I had dinner um, Tuesday night um, with yeah. a fellow sailor, Craig Venter. Maybe some of our listeners oh, know lucky. about Doctor Venter. Heard um, of him? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he was he was a wine kind of a curious story where you know it was a number of years back and the U.S. government has decided it's going to sequence the human genome. They've already spent five point five billion. They're about fifteen years in, and and Craig, who is uh, uh, not to be uh, uh, not to underestimate his abilities, says, "You know what? I could do that in in about eight months for a hundred million. And it did take him nine months. Uh, but he did. He sequenced the entire human genome, his own, I think it was, in about uh, nine yeah, months. Exactly. For uh, <laughs> boy, hundred million is a lot less than five point five billion. And um, this is all true. It was a little bit of a handshake, and let's call it a tie. And I'll wait to publish until you kind of get done. Can you pick up the pace, U.S. government? Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, he was mentioning, you know, you know, nowadays they have these little, almost looks like a flash drive, where you can pop it in your computer, and yep. and uh, you can do this nanopore sequencing right there on, you know, on a laptop right. with a little, yeah. you know, uh, compared to, I remember, you know, 34 years ago to date myself, 1990, working at Sloan Kettering, pouring these huge, oh, like three foot, gels. two foot, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, running yeah, the yeah. gels, yeah. with your four different color tubes. Them. Yes, yeah, with That's the right. different <laughs> tubes with the different yeah, colors, and don't forget to boil your samples, which oh, I gosh, didn't yeah. do the first time I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I got a more mess. color, I radioactivity, a you know. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. So, yeah, look, yeah, no, yeah that's it's... absolutely right. I mean, it's just phenomenal. That that means that whatever ideas you come up with triggers in other people's minds similar ideas that take it to the next level. And then to the next level, and then to the next level, and that's that's why you know the the the, uh, the key words here are pass it on. Uh, that's why we love education. At least that's why I do. I don't know what I'm triggering when I'm talking. To be honest, rather than just boredom. <laughs> hey, you in the front, wake up! <laughs> but when you say something like this, like we're talking right now, uh, it's like a fireside chat about the past, present, and future of, of all of biomedical research, basically, because if we could decide for ourselves by experimentation, which of these 400 species, or maybe even if there's 4,000 species, which ones have biomedical uh, implications for, for curing things, especially if they, as they relate to microtubule formation or whatever, uh, that's that's we can do that now. There is no excuse for not doing it. In fact, and and I'm sure a lot of people out there are saying, yeah, you know, we have a lot of viruses that we have to look forward to, and we have to find out where our next pandemic is going to come from. I said all of this is interrelated. All of this information is useful, and uh, 
Yeah, no, the, the authors conclude with, um, I'll say, sort of similar degree of optimism, just saying, look how far we've come, look how much we've discovered, look at all these exciting applications, there's only more to come, just, you know, yeah. be creative, be curious. Uh, that's right, that's you know, right. There's, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. And be humble. <laughs> yes. Now, I dare say that Craig Venter is not one of your more humble people. <laughs> but he's a, he's, a, he's a jocular person and he, he enjoys talking. And I, I like that about him. Yeah, my uh, dad like spent that. about 20 minutes chatting with him. So uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, they well, had that's a good, great. They had a good what time. What was the occasion? Um, it was he was actually uh, discussing Sorcerer Two. He has a new book just came out last year, much like you know your book that we should probably plug. Uh, and he spent two years, sailed sixty five thousand miles around the globe, um, oh, basically yeah. sequencing the microbiome of the the ocean yeah, yeah, and yeah, also that, right? uh, oh, yes. the Earth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a great, great, great book, great adventure. I feel like he motored a little too much. You know, should have just had the sails, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you pick your spots and then you do it. <laughs> Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> All right, so are we ready for our hero? Uh, Christina, do you want to jump in with anything else before we... No, well, I was just kind of thinking as we were talking about these all back here, I was kind of wondering... Maybe there's other ones out there that we're yet to find, you know, other oh, types absolutely. of endosymbionts, maybe in mammalian systems. No question. Um, so quite exciting. I would agree. Yeah. All right. Well, stay curious. I'm stealing that from you now. Stay curious. Stay um, curious. All right. Well, I have a hero. I'm jumping in with a, a hero. Um, and really, you know, this is a person who actually, you know, I will say, is a hero to me personally, as well as I will say to the um, global health community. So uh, our hero today is uh, Patricia F. Walker. Um, Dixon, I, I don't know if I ran into her with you or I was with Vincent. Um, I think no. I was with Vincent at one of the, uh, the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene meetings. But she's an MD. She's got a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene. Um, she's a fellow of the ASTM and H, professor of medicine at the University of Minnesota, medical director of Health Partners Travel and Medicine Center. Um, really, she was, and she's still the medical director there. Um, but I wanted to highlight this past president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hematology, who I um, I had the privilege of spending time with in Thailand and Cambodia. Um, a more pleasant and humble. Um, individual you will never meet. Um, but uh, much of what follows here is, I'm going to leave a link to this, a conversation with incoming ASTMNH president Patricia Walker. Um, <clears throat> but let me, let me go through a little, and then I'm going to add my own sort of personal experiences with uh, Dr. Walker. Um, when Dr. Walker was born, her parents were living and working in Taiwan, um, and then she was born there in Taiwan, um, but later moves to Thailand and um, Laos, where she ends up growing up. Um, when she was young, there was still a time um, when you would see people in the streets that were crippled by polio. Uh, suffering from Hansen's disease. Perhaps our listeners know that as leprosy. Um, growing up in Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War, uh, she saw how politics influenced health. She was inspired by um, a number of physicians working in Laos, such as uh, Dr. Charles Weldon and Dr. Tom Dooley. Um, and, and she relates that that immersive experience with the realities of global health and the refugee experience made a lasting impression on her. Um, enough so that she went on to medical school and did her internal medicine residency at the Mayo Clinic um, in Minnesota. Now, just a little sort of timing on where she ends up. The American Refugee Committee was formed in Minnesota um, at the height of the refugee crisis in Southeast Asia. And it was during her third year in medical school when Cambodian and Vietnamese refugees were fleeing across the border into Thailand that her older sister called and said, Pat, you speak Thai. You should go and help. So uh, Dr. Walker spent the next six weeks reading two tropical medicine textbooks cover to cover. Um, sounds like Pat Walker. Um, she then went to help and uh, uh, diagnosed her first case of Madura foot, still a neglected tropical disease to this day, um, in a refugee camp in eastern Thailand, um, having to explain to her supervising physician a disease he had never seen before. 
Um, and that tropical, that experience of working during a major international refugee crisis cemented her passion to work in tropical medicine um, and global health. Um, and she went on to have um, quite a career there. Um, I'll just add a few sort of personal things about Pat. Um, I actually had the privilege of meeting her um, in um, first in Bangkok um, when I was at uh, doing a program at Mahadal University. Um, and then we later spent time down in, in Angkor Wat at the Angkor Wat Children's Hospital. Um, but, you know, I do not speak um, Thai. I don't speak a lot of these um, different dialects, um, Burmese dialects, etc. cetera. Um, and she was always happy to jump in, basically like acting as my translator for, for this whole period of time, you know, because I, yes. I really want to go see the patients and I want to ask the patients directly. And, and I have to say a lot of the, the doctors in, um, in Bangkok, well, well, no, 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 we, we have medical students and junior doctors to get those histories for us. No, no, I want to go talk to the patients. And yes. Dr. Walk was always right there translating. And it wasn't until I think it was the last day we're having lunch together in, in Angkor Wat. And I said, you know, Pat, I understand you've got some involvement with the ASTM and H. And she's like, oh, yes, I'm the incoming president. <laughs> well, by the way. Like, really? <laughs> um, you know, and so I, I got to ask her a bunch more questions. So, yeah, what were your parents doing in this part of the world? And anyone who's heard about Air America, her father was uh, a bit involved. And so people may want to Google what was Air America and wow. who was working for Air America back then. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But really a fascinating um, woman who's just done really a tremendous amount as far as um, personal work in the area, as far as teaching, as far as inspiring others. So um, really a hero when it comes to uh, global health, parasitism, tropical medicine. Where does she work now? Um, out in Minnesota, you know, and I think that was what threw me, right? Here was this uh, this ah, right, right. Caucasian woman from Minnesota, and, you know, you sort of think in your head, and, and then you realize, like, there's so much under the surface here, just such an interesting history and such an interesting individual. So, yeah, still out in Minnesota, Minneapolis. Good stuff. She sounds like a really, um, someone who you'd like to have for a dinner party. Oh, she's yeah. great. Yeah, she's yeah, great. Absolutely, absolutely. And the Vietnamese refugees settled everywhere in the United States. Yeah. And uh, what did they do? They ended up uh, mostly opening restaurants because they, they cooked. They found out other people liked their food. And not only did they like their food, they would like to come over for dinner, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, I had the privilege of um, interviewing and then admitting at least three uh, what they used to call boat people. Do you remember the term that they used for the people that got on the ships at the very last moment before uh, the North Vietnamese took over Saigon? And uh, one of their uh, survivors, who wasn't a little kid at the time, uh, grew up and uh, applied to Columbia's medical school. And uh, all three of them brilliantly were st brilliant students. And uh, all three of them got in. So I was happy to be a, a bit of a tiny little help to a situation that was just absolutely abhorrent at the time it was occurring. Yeah, the things the things that happened. Um, when I was in uh, Cambodia with Dr. Walker, um, after you know the uh, the things that happened there, the horrific things that happened there, there were only. 50 physicians left the Khmer Rouge. So after the Khmer Rouge yeah, exactly. had their way, there were only 50 physicians left in the entire country. Right. Um, and the physicians at the Angkor Wat Children's Hospital were just so excited to get us involved. And what are your thoughts? And, you know, just to have us help in any way we could. So really. Uh, yep. Was that the one in Siem Reap? By any chance? Yeah, it's in Siem Reap. Yeah. Oh, then they had a copy of our textbook, by the way. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was before you came on board as an author. I actually was over there uh, on vacation and uh, took a book with me because I knew that there was a hospital there. And I uh, asked permission to see the physician in charge, uh, which they did not send. So they said a courier. Okay. I said, I have a gift for your hospital if you'll willingly accept it. And I handed them the book, and it was like I just gave them um, a pound of solid gold with garnets and rubies and diamonds stuck all over it. It was something that they could uh, apply immediately. 
I said, this is, I wish I had more copies, but they're heavy. <laughs> so I, I just wrote one. I actually had three and I gave two away some other places. Mm. And uh, they took it. And uh, then I learned about that hospital. And, you know, they have a, a clinic for dengue fever that's uh, seasonal uh, because dengue fever is seasonal. Yeah. And um, during the, the rainy season. And the patients have to sit out on the lawn. And yeah. sitting out on the lawn is a sure way of, a, of a guaranteeing that they will be bitten by mosquitoes while they're waiting to be treated for a disease that they just acquired from mosquitoes. Yeah, and, and all the family that, members are out there on. cooking, being bitten by the mosquitoes. It's and just... they can pass the disease on from yeah. where they are to other places as well. So it yeah. was, the conditions were, you wish you had a Craig Vent or a bank account worth of support. Yeah. You could take a couple of million dollars and uh, fix the problem. Yeah, really make a difference there. Yeah, it was Absolutely. actually Dr. Walker who helped me facilitate uh, running that marathon with the Thai princess. That uh, Oh, really? Cherished, <laughs> cherished memory. I was like, Pat, how do I sign up for this marathon? Which, I was struggling, and she, she helped me navigate the waters. But, which uh, princess was it? Was I it, do not know Shulab because there's a lot, right? <laughs> no, there was, but there was one in particular, Princess Chulaborn. Uh, who has her own 747, and she got her PhD at Columbia University in um, natural products chemistry. Mm -hmm. And when she came to visit New York, she said, is there a, an expert in malaria at Columbia? And at that point, there were none. So there's, but the Dr. Dupamia teaches the course to the medical students. Oh, he'll be fine. So I got <laughs> to have, I had dinner with her entire royal family, that she, she took an entire floor of a hotel Absolutely. For her staff. Wow. <laughs> you know, this, this yeah. princess was much younger because uh, we were doing selfies and she was doing selfies in our selfies. <laughs> <laughs> well, Selfie I had a wonderful selfies. time. I just had a, it was a wonderful evening. And so, All right. Well, let us, let us wrap that up. Uh, that is TWIP 232. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv forward slash TWIP. Send your questions or comments to twip at microbe.tv. Um, and if you like our work, please consider supporting us. Uh, go to microbe forward slash contribute. You can also go to Parasites Without Borders and click on that big contribute button. Uh, Dixon <laughs> de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Hey, you're very welcome, Daniel and Christina. A pleasure to share the trio of parasite aficionados. <laughs> <laughs> and Christina Nala is at the University of Glasgow. Thank you, Christina. Well, thank you. That was a really super interesting conversation about Wolbachia. Really enjoyed that. And I'm Daniel Griffin. Uh, you can find me at Columbia University Irving Medical Center. Um, a couple of the other podcasts, Microbe TV, Parasites Without Borders. Now, if you like our shows, please consider supporting us. We want to thank the American Society of Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. Another TWIP is Parasitic. <laughs>